So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Yang Gan, although I think she doesn't need an introduction, as many of you already know her from her brilliant book. And also she visited Tubingen a couple of times in the past. Uh, I'm very grateful that uh, she joined us today, although 3 p.m. in Germany is uh, not the most convenient time in California, I think it's 6 a.m. Uh, let me give you a bit of information about her background. She studied physics at Peking University, and then she moved to US and did her PhD in biological sciences at Columbia University. And then she moved to Rockefeller and Harvard as a postdoc, and then she moved to Berkeley as a professor, and I think uh, she uh, stayed there since then. Uh, uh, her research is quite broad. I mean, it ranges from questions like uh, mechanics of plasticity all the way to questions like visual perception and associated computations. And this broadness is not limited to the research question. Uh, she also studied the brain in many different scales. She studied from level of individual synapses and all the way to the larger scale networks. Um, and today she will tell us about a motor theory of sleep control. So without further ado, I would like to invite her to our virtual stage. So Yang, uh, please, we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, as you heard, this is actually 6 a.m. Uh, for me, uh, and usually I'm a night owl, so uh, I'm only half awake. <laughs> and uh, so bear with me if I'm a little bit uh, incoherent, and then do ask me questions uh, if I'm unclear. So I'm gonna tell you about the work that we started doing about uh, 11 or maybe, yeah, it was 11 years ago. Uh, which is sleep. So uh, as you probably all know, sleep is an essential innate behavior. Uh, we actually know how to sleep even before birth, right? We spend a lot of time in our mother's wombs. Uh, as far as we know, all animals sleep, uh, including flies and worms, and they're used as animal models to study sleep. And recently it was shown that even jellyfish uh, or hydra, uh, which don't even have a centralized nervous system, uh, they sleep as well. So pretty much any animal that has any kind of nervous system, it has to sleep. So for non-mammalian animals, uh, from worms and jellyfish to fish, uh, sleep is scored exclusively based on lack of movement. So in order to score a sleep episode, uh, the animal has to stay uh, immobile for a certain amount of time. So for example, for flies, uh, I think it's two minutes. And if you apply mild sensory stimulation, like tapping the, the container or something, they should show no motor response. So basically the final readout is all movement. For mammalian animals, uh, we measure EEG and EMG as, as a standard practice. So the EMG measures skeletal muscle tone, uh, which is somatic motor activity, and you can see a clear reduction during sleep. And then the EEG measures brain state. Uh, in general, this kind of uh, so-called desynchronized brain state, uh, meaning uh, low amplitude, high frequency activity, is associated with heightened uh, conscious experience. So for example, we experience that during both wakefulness and rapid eye movement or REM sleep. So this is the stage when we experience vivid dreams. Uh, in contrast, uh, the synchronized brain state with a lot of low frequency delta activity is associated with a lack of mental activity. And then for humans, in addition to EEG and EMG, we also measure uh, ECG, a uh, heart rate, and also some other things like breathing, which are also slowed down during sleep. So the point is that falling asleep is not only associated with a change in the brain state uh, that you can see in the EEG, but also a reduction of somatic motor activity, which you measure with EMG, and also autonomic motor activity. So my lab has been studying uh, the neural control of brain state. So what I hope to convince you today is that in the mammalian brain, at least, the neurons that put us to sleep are really associated with motor control, uh, either kind of motor control, right? So for example, um, so this is a circuit diagram for somatic motor control. Uh, up here, you can see the cortex thalamic basal ganglia loop, right? So this blue thing is the basal ganglia. 
Um, and then, of course, below that, there are also some motor control centers in the midbrain and brainstem. And they are sleep neurons in all the brain regions circled in red, right? So pretty much every level of this hierarchical network. And here is a circuit diagram for central control of cardiovascular system. And we have found sleep neurons in all of these nodes. So again, pretty much every level of the network. So this is really the take home message, right? So most of the sleep neurons are associated with one of these two uh, motor control circuits. And so the rest of the time, I will just show you the data. So a bit of a background, uh, pioneered by Morusi and Magoon, and of course, followed by many scientists' uh, work. Uh, we now know a lot about the brain's arousal system. So these include a lot of the well-known neuromodulatory systems, right? The monoamines, such as noradrenaline, the locus julius, dopamine, uh, serotonin, and histamine. And also the, hist uh, the cholinergic systems in both the brainstem and basal forebrain, and of course, also some peptidergic systems. Uh, the best studied one is the orexin system in the hypothalamus. And of course, there are also many glutamatergic and GABAergic neurons uh, in these brain regions. But in contrast, we know far less about the sleep circuit. So here is a textbook version of how sleep is controlled. Now, according to this, there's a single sleep center in the so-called pre-optic area or POA in the anterior hypothalamus. So the idea is that the POA sleep neurons promote sleep by inhibiting a lot of these wake promoting neurons. And indeed, using uh, retrograde uh, tracing and followed by gene profiling, we were able to identify. So we basically did retrograde tracing from these wake centers. We were able to identify a subset of the GABAergic neurons in the POA that promote sleep. But it turns out that this is not the whole story because uh, I think it was about six or seven years ago, uh, we and others have also found some sleep neurons far outside of the POA, suggesting that sleep is actually controlled by a more distributed network. So then to try to get an idea of what this entire control network might look like, we decided to do a whole brain screening for sleep neurons. So we have two basic criteria for sleep neurons. First, they need to be sleep promoting so their activation should increase sleep and their inactivation should decrease sleep. And second, they should be sleep active, right? So we need to make sure they're naturally active at the right time to uh, promote sleep. So for screening, we also had two corresponding strategies. Um, one was to screen for sleep promoting neurons and then see if they're also sleep active. Uh, and the second one is to screen for sleep active neurons and then see if they're also sleep promoting. So I'm gonna show you an example of each strategy today. Uh, first, to screen for sleep active neurons, we use uh, the so-called false trap technique developed by Li Chun Luo's uh, lab. So we uh, crossed two mouse lines together. Uh, one of them expresses CRE-ER under the false promoter. So we all know that false uh, in the mammalian brain is in activity dependent immediate early gene. So the active neurons, should uh, turn on false and therefore in this mouse should express cre -ER. And the other mouse expresses a fluorescent reporter, in this case, GAP, in a cre dependent manner. So when we divided uh, the cross mice into two groups, uh, we call one of the groups the SD or sleep deprived group. So basically we injected uh, this fast acting tamoxifen during sleep de uh, deprivation. The idea is that uh, the wake active neurons that should be active during sleep deprivation, they should express CRE-ER and the injection of tamoxifen should cause the CRE-ER protein to enter the nucleus and therefore turn on uh, GAP for permanent labeling of the wake active neurons. And in the second group, uh, uh, we call them the recovery sleep or R R RS group. We first sleep deprive them for six hours and then inject tamoxifen during recovery sleep to label the sleep active neurons. 
So this uh, project was done by Zhe Zhang uh, and Peng Zhong. Uh, both are former postdocs in my lab, and Zhe is now running her own lab uh, in, in uh, Shanghai. So when we divided these, uh, so when we compare these two groups, uh, groups of mice and look at the GAP labeling across the whole brain, we saw this one brain region, uh, which is the ventral region of the periaqueductal gray, the PAG, which is this sort of uh, pear-shaped structure in the brain. Um, we saw a lot more GAP labeling in the RS group uh, than the SD group. So next we wanted to figure out who these GAP labeled neurons are uh, in the ventral pack. So for that, we did a gene profiling. So this is actually not single cell RNA-seq, but bulk sequencing. Um, so the reporter mouse that we uh, use expresses not only GAP, but also a ribosomal protein called LTNA, which normally attaches to mRNA for protein synthesis, right? So this is what the ribosomal protein does. So um, when we use an antibody against GAP to pull down LTNA, we can also pull down the mRNA attached to the ribosome, and then we can sequence the mRNA. So in this, uh, what they call the volcano plot, uh, each dot is a single gene. Uh, so this axis is the relative expression level, and this axis is the significance level of that particular gene. Um, in the putative sleep neurons compared to the entire chunk of tissue. So if we zoom in to this red box here, uh, these are the genes that are highly significantly enriched in the putative sleep neurons. So if we look at what genes are in here, right? So this blue dot is the ribosomal protein that we introduce to the cells, right? So this is just a positive control. Uh, but there are a whole bunch of other genes. And we decided to focus on neuropeptides, uh, these red dots here, for two reasons. Uh, one of them is scientific because we know that neuropeptides are important for signaling, just like the traditional neurotransmitters neurotransport uh, like glutamate and GABA. But the other, reasons, uh, the other reason is practical. So uh, if you study uh, mouse as your animal model, uh, there just happen to be a lot of Cree mouse lines that you can buy um, that are targeted to label the peptidergic neurons. So now, um, if we look at the three neuropeptides that are enriched, uh, one of them uh, called Kelka, uh, which is Kelsey Tony gene related peptide alpha, um, it shows a high overlap with the GAP labeling of the putative sleep neurons in this region. So we decided to focus on the Kelka cells. So the first thing we did was to make sure that these Kelka neurons are indeed sleep active, because even though our screening is designed to screen for sleep active neurons, uh, the CFOS based technique is actually not perfect because FOS depends on activity, but also some other things. So we wanted to make sure uh, that these are sleep active uh, directly. So for that, we tagged these Kalka neurons with channel adoption uh, using a Kalka Cree mouse generated by Richard Palmiter's lab. And for recording, we use Optrode, uh, which consists of an optic fiber in the middle surrounded by several bundles of electrodes. So here is a unit recorded in vivo. Uh, and you can see that um, every time we turn on the, the laser uh, briefly for 10 milliseconds, uh, this little blue dot here, it evoked a spiking uh, reliably at a very short latency. So that indicates to that to us that this is a neuron that expresses channel adoption and therefore it should be calcasol. So once we identify a unit like this, we turn off the laser and record a spontaneous activity. So this is our standard uh, experiment. The upper panel is the EEG spectrogram over time. Uh, and then here's the EMG trace. And this panel is the color-coded brain state, right? So we uh, uh, classify brain state automatically based on EEG and EMG. And here's the firing rate of an identified Kalka cell. So you can see that this neuron has a high firing rate whenever the animal is in non-REM sleep, right? The orange period. And the firing rate is low during both REM, uh, which is uh, light blue, and also wake, which is gray. 
So here is a summary of all the Calca cells. Uh, it's more than 30 cells. We identified uh, each line as one cell. For the great majority of them, uh, the firing rate is the highest during non-REM sleep uh, compared to both wakefulness and REM. So we know that most of the Calca neurons are non-REM active. So this is our first criterion. And now we wanted to know if they're non-REM promoting. So for this is our standard protocol for optogenetic experiment. Uh, we turn on the laser for two minutes per trial for no particularly good reason. Uh, for some reason, early uh, in our sleep studies, we just decided two minutes is our uh, trial duration. And then people just sort of stuck to this uh, as a standard protocol. So the laser shading is the laser. Uh, so the blue shading indicates a laser stimulation period and the intertrial interval is somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes, I think. And so here is a summary of all the trials from all the mice that we tested. And you can see that when we turn the light at time zero, uh, it caused them pretty rapid increase in the probability of non-REM sleep, uh, this orange line. And there's a decrease in both wake and REM sleep. But when we inactivated these neurons uh, using this inhibitory option IC++, uh, we saw a decrease in uh, non-REM sleep. We also did uh, chemogenetic activation. So optogenetic activation is acute, right? So we turn on a laser for two minutes per trial. Uh, chemogenetic activation is slower, right? Basically when we inject CNO, it costs activation for a couple of hours. But you can see that for GQ mediated uh, activation, it also caused an increase in non-REM sleep. Uh, so the solid circle is CNO and the open circle is saline control. Uh, but the GI mediated inactivation caused a decrease in non-REM sleep. So now based on both optogenetic and chemogenetic activation and inactivation, uh, we can conclude that the calca neurons are non-REM promoting. So this is our second criterion. Now, for the sake of time, I'm just going to skip a bunch of data and just tell you that in addition to calca cells, we also found some other populations of cells in the ventral region of the pack. So some of them express the peptide CCK and others express neurotensin. So all of these neurons are excitatory because they also are glutamatergic. Now these excitatory uh, non-REM neurons in the, in the ventral region of the pack, they actually project to several GABAergic populations that also promote non-REM sleep. And they do so by inhibiting a, a bunch of the wake promoting neuronal populations. So um, you can see that among the GABAergic populations, actually the POA is one of them, right? So the POA is the textbook sleep center. Um, so basically we confirm this textbook sleep center except that it's actually not unique because it's just one of the several populations of GABAergic non-REM neurons. So based on the, uh, these connections that we traced out, we think that the ventral PAG might be an excitatory sleep center that's actually upstream of these inhibitory sleep centers. So that's the first strategy, right? The screening for sleep active neurons. And now I'm going to switch to the second strategy, which is to screen for sleep promoting neurons. In fact, I think I'm gonna tell you uh, two examples, but I'll try to go quickly uh, using this strategy. So the basic idea behind this strategy is actually incredibly simple. Um, so this is something that, you know, even a high school student or maybe um, primary school student can, can think of. Um, so we're gonna start with the um, wake promoting neurons. Like I said, we actually know a whole bunch of them uh, scattered all over the brain. And we're gonna use retrograde tracing to find their inhibitory input, right? The idea is that if you have a neuron that inhibits wake promoting neurons, then chances are it actually promotes sleep, right? Because sleep and wake are kind of antagonistic brain states. And then once we find the inhibitory sleep neurons, we're gonna trace one more step back and look for their excitatory input. Because if you have a neuron that excites 
um, sleep promoting neurons, then its activity could potentially promote sleep. So this was done by Chen Yan Ma, a really, really talented postdoc uh, in my lab. So she's actually um, just about, so this was her first project and she's just about wrapping up her second project and get on the job market. So what Chen Yan did was to target a whole group of wake promoting neurons and look for brain regions with relatively broad GABAergic innervation of the wake neurons. So these uh, are the wake promoting populations that Chen Yan targeted. Uh, they include a variety of cell types. For example, this one is histaminergic, uh, cholinergic, uh, noradrenergic, and some glutamatergic and GABAergic neurons uh, in these different uh, brain regions. And here is a list of brain regions with relatively broad GABAergic innervation of these wake centers. So these bars innervate, uh, indicate the relative proportion of GABAergic uh, innervation. So this list includes the POA, right? Again, the uh, textbook sleep center. But to our surprise, the top candidate that came out of the screening was actually the central nucleus of the amygdala, the CEA. So here um, uh, on the left, you're seeing the list of brain regions uh, with the wake promoting neurons that Chen Yan targeted with rabies uh, retrograde tracing. And here you can see that uh, if you zoom in to this little white square, which is a CEA, um, you can see a lot of the rabies virus labeled, GAP labeled cells that overlap with the GABAergic marker, GAD1 or 2. So then again, we wanted to figure out who these GABAergic neurons are. And for that, we again did this bulk sequencing. So uh, if you zoom into this box with highly enriched genes, again, if you focus on neuropeptides, there are three of them. And among the three neuropeptides that are enriched, we found this peptide neurotensin that shows a high overlap with the rabies uh, GAP labeling. So by the way, uh, these three markers, they show a substantial overlap uh, with amongst themselves. But we decided that NTS is actually the best uh, marker uh, in terms of overlap with the rabies labeling. So then we tested uh, the effect of activating the neurotensin neurons, right? So again, this is a screening for sleep promoting neurons based on the anatomy, but we wanted to test this functionally. So again, this is optogenetic activation. You can see that that increased an increase in non-REM and here's inactivation, there's a decrease in non-REM sleep. So we know that the NTS neurons are non-REM promoting. So now what about, are they uh, um, naturally uh, sleep active. So again, optical recording, uh, here's an example cell, and here's a summary. Now, the great majority of the identified um, uh, NTS neurons, uh, these blue dots, are in the upper right quadrant. Um, so this plot is basically the horizontal axis tells us the relative firing rate between non-REM sleep and wake. The vertical is REM versus wake. So most of the blue dots are in the upper right quadrant, indicating that these cells are um, more active during both non-REM and REM sleep compared to wakefulness. But at least they're all sleep active. Uh, not all of them, but the great majority of them. Uh, whereas the unidentified units, these gray dots are scattered all over the place. So based on this, we know that most of the uh, CEA NTS neurons are sleep active. Okay, so now we have a population of GABAergic neurons uh, that promote non-REM sleep. Uh, as promised, we're gonna trace one more step back and look for their excitatory input. So when we targeted these uh, CEA NTS neurons, uh, we found a couple of brain regions with uh, strong glutamatergic input. One of them is this region here. So it's actually a part of the thalamus. So you see this blue blob here. So these are all the glutamatergic neurons. This actually corresponds to this region here, right? So, so this makes sense because we know that in the mouse brain, in the thalamus, most of them are glutamatergic, expressing VGLU2. So the babies labeled cells are actually sitting sort of at the, at the medial edge of the posterior thalamus. 
So again, we wanted to figure out who these cells are. So obviously these are not all the glutamatergic neurons because they're only in the medial edge, right? So we have to find a more specific marker. Now it turns out in this case, we got lucky because Right, remember uh, in uh, the CEA, right, NTS turns out to be a great marker for the sleep neurons. So here we said, what about NTS in this region? So when we looked at the Allen uh, mouse brain atlas, uh, their in situ hybridization data set, it turns out that NTS is exactly expressed in this medial edge of the posterior thalamus. And indeed, when we compared uh, NTS expression with rabies labeling, we saw a high degree of overlap. So here we didn't have to do gene profiling, we just made a lucky guess. Okay, so now we wanted to test the function of these thalamic NTS neurons. Again, uh, optogenetic activation, increase in non-REM sleep, inactivation, decrease in non-REM. So these uh, posterior thalamic neurons are also non-REM promoting. Now we have two populations, right? So one is GABAergic and the other is glutamatergic. And yet the common uh, marker is neurotensin. So the obvious question then is whether the neuropeptide itself is doing anything rather than just a convenient marker uh, that we can use uh, to use the Cree line to target these cells. So what Chen Yan did here was to use a CRISPR technique to uh, try to knock down uh, neurotensin. So this is a pretty complicated uh, construct that uh, Chen Yan designed. So this was still um, a, few a few years earlier before we had a lot of commercial uh, tools for CRISPR. So she had to design this construct herself. So the key point is here, uh, the, the guided RNA. Now for this part, she either designed a sequence that targeted neurotensin or control, which is LAC-Z, or uh, is actually uh, uh, the GABAergic transporter, uh, uh, VGAT. Uh, so you can knock down uh, GABAergic transmission. So, uh, so here I'm just showing you that uh, you can see that uh, when we compare to the control, where you see a lot of uh, neurotensin expression, if you use the NTS uh, guide RNA, that greatly reduces the NTS expression compared to the control. So that's true bo for both the CEA and the posterior thalamus. So this CRISPR technique actually works. Now, when we tested the effect of optogenetic activation, uh, you can see that for control, right? So again, we injected a, a random guide RNA that shouldn't do anything. Uh, optogenetic activation of the CA neurons still increased non-REM sleep, but when we uh, injected the guide RNA for neurotensin, it greatly reduced the increase in non-REM sleep. And the same thing is true if we try to knock down GABAergic transmission. Now for the posterior thalamus, uh, NTS knockdown pretty much wiped out the effect of non-REM sleep. And the same thing is true if we knock down glutamatergic transmission. So this is the guide RNA for VGLU2. So based on these experiments, it seems like both the neuropeptide and the traditional transmitter, uh, glutamate for thalamus and GABA for CEA, are important for the non-run promoting effect of these cells. So this is all we have, right? So we don't know exactly how they're doing it, right? Whether the peptide and the traditional transmitter, they have an additive effect or they have some kind of sequential effect, right? So who knows, maybe peptide transmission is required for normal uh, synaptic transmission or whatever, right? So the cellular, mechanism we don't know, but at least based on the CRISPR knockout, we know that uh, both of them are important. So um, I also wanted to point out that I just showed you the data that neurotensin neurons in both the CEA and posterior thalamus are, um, you know, these are non-REM neurons and the peptide is important for non-REM sleep. But it turns out that NTS is actually a general marker for multiple non-REM neurons. Uh, scattered all over the brain. There's another population in the ventral region of the pack. I didn't show you the data, but I already mentioned this population uh, earlier uh, in the first part. Um, and also there's another population in the subthalamic nucleus, which I'll actually show you one slide later. 
Uh, in addition to data from my lab, um, Yu Hayashi's lab in Japan has also discovered, they also found uh, this population in the pack, but there's also another population in the medial vestibular nucleus uh, in the brainstem that are neurotensinergic that promote non-REM sleep. So this is already a pretty long list, but I, I have a suspicion that this list is gonna grow even further. And the reason is that it turns out that neurotensin as a peptide um, has long been known to have two main effects. One is hypothermia, right, reducing body temperature, and the other is hypotension, reducing blood pressure. And it turns out that both of these things happen during normal non-REM sleep. So I think that this is actually not a coincidence, right? Uh, there's a pretty um, deep logic for why this peptide is a marker for non-REM neurons. Okay, so now um, I just showed you an example of using this strategy. And I want to quickly take you through another example, uh, which is the third population that came out of this anatomical screening. So this was characterized by uh, Dan Tian Liu uh, is the substantia nigra pars reticulata, the SNR. So now many of you might know that the SNR is actually the output stage of the basal ganglia, right? So basal ganglia is very well known to be, um, you know, the major region for motor control, which you have a problem with in Parkinson's disease. So now, um, you know, remember when we did this, we were just doing blind screening, right? We didn't care what that brain region is called or what it's known to be doing. But then SNR is just too very well known to be involved in motor control, right? And yet it came out of our sleep screening. So we decided to also take a look at motor activity of the mice uh, in our sleep studies. So in addition to EEG and EMG, we added a video recording of the mouse behavior. And our collaborators, uh, Hua Han and Wei Fu Li in Beijing, um, told us how to uh, use deep learning, right, which is all the rage nowadays, uh, you guys probably know very well, uh, to train this convolutional uh, neural network for image segmentation. So here is the original image, the mouse, and this is what the, the network thinks the mouse is. So once we did this, uh, it's pretty straightforward to extract some motor-related uh, parameters of the mouse. So we looked at two uh, general parameters. One is translation, uh, which is basically the center of mass of the mouse in two different uh, frames. And we look at how much it moved. The other is total movement, which is basically the total number of pixels that are non-overlap between the two time frames. So we plotted these two parameters uh, in this 2D space, and we saw three clusters. The dark green cluster corresponds to locomotion, the biggest kind of movement the mouse exhibits. The light green is all the other smaller movement, uh, non-locomotor, uh, basically feeding, uh, grooming, or some postural adjustment. The gray cluster is immobility. But when we looked at uh, EEG and EMG recording, we actually saw that there are two different beha uh, behavior states. One is quiet wakefulness and the other is actual sleep. So there are basically two or uh, four uh, behavior states. Now, you guys probably know that nowadays people use a lot of sort of automatic video analysis to classify motor behavior, but they were focusing on the fine motor movement, right? Like a reaching of the paw on the actual trajectory and things like that. But in our analysis, we deliberately sort of did a coarse grain classification of motor states rather than particular motor activity. So now here I'm plotting the uh, EEG delta power across the four behavior states. So remember in the introduction, I said the delta power, low frequency activity, the more of that you have, the less aroused your brain is, right? So here you can see that uh, across the four states, right, delta power increases progressively. And here I'm plotting the total EMG power uh, across the four states. Now, one common here, which is that if you look at the three greenish states, right, so all of these are wake states. 
So we tend to think of their difference in terms of motor activity, right? And clearly you see a difference in EMG activity. But if you look at the EEG, right, the brain state delta power, there's also a systematic difference. Now, the quite awake and sleep states, both of these are immobility states. So we tend to think of their difference in terms of brain states. But if you look at the EMG, there's also a clear difference. So the point here is that both the brain state and the motor states, right, they're highly correlated across uh, across multiple behavior states, right? It's not just, you know, motor versus brain states, right? So both are correlated across multiple states. Okay, so next we looked at the transitions uh, across states and it turns out that they're not random. So if the mouse started out in local motion, uh, they always transition into non-local motor movement. We have never seen a case where they were moving, uh, running around uh, at one moment and just fall asleep the next moment, right? So they just don't have these rapid, you know, abrupt transition. Now, narcoleptic animals, have that, right? But here we're recording from normal mice and they don't do that. Just like normal humans uh, don't have those uh, abrupt transitions. And of course, if they start out in um, uh, other movements, they either go back to running or into quiet wakefulness. They don't go into sleep either. So if we place these four states into a single chain, uh, then most of the transitions are between neighboring states. So sometimes obviously, right, they can transition into themselves, meaning that they stay in the same state, but all the transitions are out, right? They're between neighboring states. The only exception is that occasionally they wake up from sleep and immediately go into movement and skip quiet wakefulness. Okay, so that was the behavior. And now we wanted to go back to SNR. And it turns out that there are actually two types of GABAergic neurons in the SNR. The type that expresses um, parvalbumin or PV, they're mostly sitting in the lateral SNR. And the PV negative, but GAT2 positive uh, GABAergic neurons are mostly in the medial SNR. So when we recorded from the PV cells in the lateral SNR, it turns out that most of them are actually more active during movement, right? So this is the firing rate, and you can see that these cells are pretty active during locomotion and movement, and not so active during sleep. So the PV cells are actually not sleep active. But the GAT2 neurons, most of them are most active during sleep and less active during movement. So this is just a superposition of the population average of the two cell types, and you can see the opposite trend. So when we optogenetically activated the GAT2 neurons uh, in the upper panel, you can see an immediate reduction of both types of movement and an increase in sleep. But PV neuron activation has very little effect on sleep. In fact, the main effect of activating these cells is to stop movement and slightly increase quiet wakefulness. So they seem to sort of suppress movement, which is the kind of the known function of the SNR neurons, but they don't do much about sleep. But when we inactivated the GAT2 neurons, uh, we saw huge increase in movement and decrease in sleep. But uh, inactivating the PV cells again, has a little bit of effect, but it's much, much weaker compared to the GAT2 neurons. So it seems like it's the GAT2, but not the PV neurons that are sleep active and their activation um, suppresses movement and enhances sleep. Now, one way to suppress movement and enhance sleep is to cause direct transition out of movement into sleep, right? A direct transition. But it turns out that this is not what these cells do. So these are all the transitions that we see uh, during uh, GAT2 neuron activation with CR CHR2. You can see that all of these arrows here, uh, hopefully you remember you have seen them during the natural transitions without any optogenetic manipulation, right? So activation does not create artificial transitions that do not exist naturally. What it does is to bias the direction uh, of the existing transitions. So all the enhanced 
transitions, right? These red arrows kind of go downwards and the suppressed transitions tend to go upwards. So here again, I want to sort of make a comment, right? Now, when you look at the locomotion to other movements, we would say, normally we would say that's motor control. Now movement to quiet wakefulness, we call it motor control. But from quiet wakefulness to sleep, all in a sudden we call it brain state control. But in fact, right, all of these transitions, each of these transitions um, is associated with both the EEG change and the EMG change, right? So these names are really just artificial. We impose on them, right? In fact, these neurons, they couldn't care less about what we call these transitions, right? All they do is to push the animal down the chain one step at a time. So here's the effect of inactivation, and you can see that most of the increased transitions tend to go upwards and the downward transitions tend to be suppressed. Okay, so that was the uh, behavioral effect. And then we looked at the um, projections of these SNR neurons. Now the PV cells, in fact, this is well known for people studying the basal ganglia. So these project to the, uh, the motor region of the thalamus, the motor layers of the superior colliculus, and also this region, people call it the mesencephalic or midbrain local motor region, uh, generally this region. So all of these are well-known motor control regions targeted by the SNR neurons. Now, if you look at the GAT2 neurons, they do project to these motor regions, but in addition, they also project to the dorsal raphe, which contains both glutamate, uh, which contains both dopaminergic and serotonergic neurons, known to be important for brain state control. But you can see that the PV neurons don't project here. Now the GATO neurons also project to the locus ceruleus with uh, noradrenergic neurons, uh, also important for brain state control. And then we looked at whether you know, it's a different subset of, subsets of neurons that project to these different targets or it's actually the axon collaterals of the same populations. So here we use the viral trick to label the subset of the SNR, SNR neurons that project to the thalamus. So you can see their thalamic axon terminals, but in addition, you also see the axons in the dorsal raphe uh, and the uh, locus ceruleus. In this case, we targeted the subset of the SNR neurons that project to the dorsal raphe, right? So you can see the axons here, but you also see their axon collaterals in these motor regions, including the motor thalamus. So it seems like uh, instead of separate subpopulations that project to the brain state control regions and the motor regions, it's the same population that send axon collaterals to both types of brain regions. Now we think that this kind of collateral arrangement is important for how these neurons coordinate the change in motor state and brain states, right? Remember I said earlier, EEG and EMG changes are coordinated across multiple, multiple behavior states. And so we think that this is how these cells can coordinate those two changes. Okay, so again, uh, we have a GABAergic population. What about their upstream input? Now, it turns out that um, this is, again, very well known for people studying the basal ganglia. The main glutamatergic input to the STN uh, came from the, uh, to the SNR came from the STN, the subthalamic nucleus. So these neurons are um, glutamatergic. Uh, they also turn out to be uh, neurotensinergic. And so in this case, we actually use neurotensin as a marker because VGU2 is way too broad uh, beyond the subthalamic nucleus, but neurotensin is pretty specific in this region. So when we activated the neurotensinergic neurons in the STN, we again saw increase in non-REM sleep. Okay, so um, at the beginning, I said falling asleep is associated with a reduction of somatic motor activity, but also things like um, slow down the heart rate. So now I'm gonna spend the next few minutes to tell you about another circuit uh, involved in cardiovascular control. And that's the barrel reflex circuit. So barrel reflex is a rapid negative feedback. Um, the idea is that an increase in the blood pressure uh, 
sensed by baroreceptors in the periphery, uh, the signal is sent to this brainstem region called the nucleus of the solitary tract, uh, NST. And this triggers a number of changes in both the heart and the blood vessels to uh, reduce the blood pressure, to stabilize blood pressure. So the idea is that you, you want to prevent huge blood pressure uh, fluctuations because that might burst the blood vessels. Okay, so the bare reflex circuit is, is quite well worked out. There are two main pathways. The one on the right, uh, the NST neurons send excitatory connections to this region called the CVLM, which contains GABAergic neurons that inhibit the RVLM. Uh, the RVLM contains adrenergic neurons that are sympathetic, right? So these neurons project to the spinal cord, eventually innervating the blood vessels. And so pathway on the left, the NST excites the nucleus ambiguous, which contains cholinergic uh, preganglionic parasympathetic neurons that project to the heart to slow down the heart, again, for blood pressure stabilization. So what Yuan Yuan did was to first isolate the NST neurons that are involved in cardiovascular control because the NST uh, contains a wide variety of neurons involved in many different functions. So again, she used uh, this trap technique developed by Li Chun Luo's lab. But in this case, she injected the drug called phenylephrine that caused an increase in the blood pressure, uh, which also triggers a decrease in the heart rate as part of the barrel reflex. And here you can see that uh, phenylephrine uh, caused the trapping of many neurons in the solitary tract compared to salient control. And then Yuan Yuan recorded from these trapped neurons to make sure they're indeed cardiovascular. So here is a recording. Uh, here is the blood pressure, heart rate. The mouse was moving freely in the home cage with natural um, cardiovascular fluctu fluctuation. And you can see that here is an identified trap neuron and the firing rate follows the ups and downs of the blood pressure quite well. Now, when we zoomed in temporarily, it turns out that the subset of these neurons are actually time locked to individual heartbeats, right? So you can see that the spikes and the ECG are very much time locked. So that suggests that these neurons are actually sensitive to the blood pressure fluctuations uh, within single cardiac cycles. So all of this is to show that these neurons are indeed cardiovascular. So now the question is, do they do anything about sleep? So here is optogenetic activation. Uh, in addition to decreasing the blood pressure and heart rate, it also increased uh, non-REM sleep, right? So uh, again, cardiovascular, motor control, and brain state control. So then Yuan Yuan looked at downstream targets. Uh, first, she targeted the CVLM GABAergic neurons. That also increased non-REM sleep. We think that this is partly mediated by the known inhibition of the RVLM adrenergic neurons because direct inhibition of these cells also caused increase in uh, non-REM sleep. In fact, we think we know why because previous studies have shown that the RVLM adrenergic neurons send excitatory connections to the locus Julius, right? Which is known to be important for uh, brain arousal. And when she uh, inactivated the CVLM garbage neurons that cause decrease in non-REM sleep, and the same thing is true if you activate the RVLM ad adrenergic neurons. And then we also looked at the, uh, the other pathway, the nucleus ambiguous, but in this case, we use chemogenetic activation. And the reason is technical because the AMB is a very long and thin structure. So it's very hard to hit a lot of the cells with a single optic fiber for optogenetic activation. Uh, but you can see that chemogenetic activation also caused an increase in non-REM sleep in addition to the decrease in heart rate, which is the expected effect. Okay, so that's it. And now to sum up. So as I said, uh, falling asleep is associated with a change in the brain state, EEG, uh, and also reduction of both somatic and autonomic motor activity. So it makes sense for the sleep control mechanism to inhibit the arousal system and also the autonomic and somatic motor control circuits. 
So I just told you uh, the STN, SNR pathway, right, which is part of the basal ganglia that promotes sleep. Now, I, I didn't, uh, so I also showed you that uh, Chen Yan has found the neurotensin neurons in part of the thalamus that promote non-REM sleep, right? So the thalamus is also circled. Now, my lab, we did not look at the uh, striatum, but uh, there are other labs, uh, uh, Jili Huang's lab and, um, and uh, Michael Lazarus' lab. They have shown that the neurons in the indirect pathway, the so-called D2 receptor expressing neurons in the striatum, both the dorsal striatum and ventral striatum, if you activate those cells, right? we know if you activate them, they suppress motor activity, but they have shown that that also promote non-REM sleep. So the striatum is circled. Now, I didn't show the data, but we have also found the population of neurons in the uh, medulla um, called GIV that promote non-REM sleep. And it turns out the Sylvia Arbor's lab, uh, who studies uh, motor control, they found the same region, the gap urging neurons actually causes a pause of locomotion, right? So if the mouse was like walking, if they turn on the light, the mouse will stop moving. And in fact, the body will collapse, right? So that indicates a loss of muscle tone. And of course, in our case, we call those sleep neurons because there's also a corresponding EEG change. So that's why I'm circling all of these regions in the somatic motor control system. Now, I showed you the uh, neurons in the uh, solitary tract and the ventral lateral medulla, periaqueductal gray, uh, the amygdala, and of course the hypothalamus, right? So all of these regions can, uh, contain non-REM neurons. And in fact, all of these are key nodes of the central autonomic network. In fact, they pretty much you know, cover everything in the central autonomic network. So this is why um, it seems that like in, instead of being separate, right, as implied by this circuit diagram, the sleep control circuit deeply infiltrates both the somatic and autonomic motor circuits, which is why I'm moving that yellow circle into these two motor boxes. So it seems like the way that um, these neurons coordinate motor, either autonomic or somatic motor uh, uh, changes and brain state changes, um, one way to do this is through axon collaterals. So I showed you the example uh, for the SNR, but I think that there are other examples um, in the autonomic network that follows the same logic. It seems like it's a pretty you know, useful strategy for coordinating uh, brain state and motor changes. So now it gets sort of a little philosophical. Now this kind of motor centric view, right? So instead of separate sleep control, um, the sleep neurons are really just part of these motor right, circuits. So this motor centric view also has implications for this question of why we sleep, right? So today, everything I told you about is how we sleep. But the other big question is why do we sleep? Now, the fact that these sleep neurons are so closely linked to motor circuits suggests to us that a function of sleep is to promote some biological processes that are fundamentally incompatible with movement, right? So we know that they probably include memory consolidation, maybe clearance of some brain waste and, and some other things, right? But all of these ideas, to me, would have to be compatible with this kind of motor-centric view and how, you know, that's the question that we're thinking about. But to me, the other probably a basic fundamental function of sleep is simply to promote some cellular repair and rejuvenation. And that needs to happen both peripherally, we know that muscle cells need to do that, and also some brain cells um, that, that need to be repaired. So those are the things that we're looking into right now in my lab. And finally, these are the people in my lab who actually did all the work. Uh, I think I mentioned most of their names. So I, I think I mentioned the data from uh, all the people here and also Peng's data. Uh, I didn't mention the data from Min and Xinjie and Franz. So these are the early pioneers in my lab who joined my lab uh, 11 years ago. 
when I first got into the sleep field, I had no idea of how to study them. And these are the people who figure out the key techniques that allowed us to, um, uh, to study the sleep circuit. We also had many collaborators who uh, helped us along, uh, along the way with various techniques. And uh, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Yang, for this great presentation and very massive uh, data. Uh, I mean, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, if and, and there's no questions, I I can start actually. Um, I, I wanted to ask you. I mean, you basically like extensively explored the cortex. I mean, and subcortex uh, uh, with very ma ma macro techniques. I was curious if uh, also you looked into interaction between these structures or these neurons and hippocampal structure because they are also extensively involved in the sleep. And also they has been shown that they have large scale signatures both on the brain side and also on the body side. Like for example, the recent Buzaki's paper to show that insulin, I mean, metabolism change, Nico's paper shows that, I mean, for example, there's a whole brain modulation. Do you have any idea about, I mean, interaction between hippocampus and uh, these structures also? Yeah, it's actually a, a great uh, uh, question. Um, so we, uh, um, we thought about it a lot, but haven't really done anything. In fact, uh, in Chen Yan's um, uh, screening, she also found some neurons in... Um, okay, so, so, so one thing I want to point out is that um, uh, we got really interested in neurotensin, right? Um, because, you know, Chen Yan first found it, and then we found, you know, that they're, they label... Uh, sleep neurons in other brain regions. So we started looking at neurotensin expression all over the brain. And one of the regions with a high number of neurotensin neurons is the, um, uh, what's it called, the septum, right? So as you know, the septum is strongly linked to the hippocampus. In fact, there's another uh, very big population of neurotensin neurons, I think in part of the subiculum, um, I've been dying to look into that. In fact, there was one period in my life where I was obsessively pushing everybody in my lab to look at different populations of neurotensin neurons. The people in my lab just kind of rebelled because they felt like there is no novelty. It's just another population of neurotensin neurons. Uh, so after I pushed, you know, basically in, in futile for a long time, I stopped, but they're still kind of on my list um, to hopefully convince some people to look into at some point. I can just kind of hope you can convince them and see more results on that structure. Also, I, I love your uh, Yuri's uh, story because I'm totally, yeah. you know, I think in neuroscience we all have this sort of brain chauvinistic view. The rest of the body mm -hmm. doesn't matter; it's just yes, there course, yes, to yes. provide blood supply to the brain. Um, but in fact, it's not like that at all. So I'm, uh, I really think that there's this whole brain body sort of communication um, is uh, yes, there's a lot to it. I mean, you already oh, shown also back. with the... Uh, sorry. Um... Uh, yes, Zoom always makes things difficult. So that was a wonderful talk. I, I would like to ask you a question about possibly dis disambiguating between uh, signals in the brain that might promote state transitions, like your elevator model between the four different levels going up and down, um, and then signals that might be encoding the state itself, like which floor of the elevator model you're on, and also then which neurons might just be involved in the expression of the state, but not necessarily the maintenance or encoding of it. And so when you say something's promoting sleep, but then if you turn off your stimulus laser, if it goes back to what it was doing before, then maybe it's not actually encoding the state. So can you say something about how you distinguish between those? Right. So, so I mean, in, um, my guess is that my uh, interpretation of the word encoding is less sophisticated than you are, right? But to me, you know, um, it's not like vision, which I used to study, right? When you encode something, it's very complicated. It contains, you know, very specific information about shapes and, and the curvature and things like that. But uh, to me, you know, at least the way that we study it, sleep is just, you know, yes or no. Are you sleep or are you not, right? So there are three states, non rem REM, and, and wake, right? So in, in that sense, encoding just means that these neurons are active during sleep. So if we interpret the word encoding in that simple sense, then you know, when these neurons are indeed sleep active, you could say that they're encoding sleep. 
right? But 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 I I suspect that you mean encoding like encoding some processes in sleep or something something more than the, just that, right? I think maybe the. The question that's really interesting is just what sets the duration, right? They're in room for some amount of time. They're in non room for some amount of time. So if you have a constant signal, that can't be the signal that controls the duration. There must be something that's evolving across time in order to actually set timing. Great. Yeah. So so I I didn't mention that. Um, so I totally agree with you, right? In fact, um, you know, if you think about the way that we think about it. Okay, you have weak neurons, you have REM neurons, you have non-REM neurons, right? And they inhibit each other, right? But it's a three-way interac uh, interaction, right? There's a whole other story on that. Um, but, right, it's like a tug of war, right? Either side can, I mean, it's not like either side can determine completely which side is gonna win, right? And that's why you have a competition because if it's always predetermined, what's the point of doing that, right? And so, so I think that they're kind of, in a way they're competing and you can think about tractor networks or whatever, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there, there's something like that too because each state is kind of, you know, it's stable, right? Um, but then who decides, you know, which side is gonna win at each moment in time? That has to be outside of just these neurons that we, right figured out right so so uh, so for that there is this famous two process model in fact there are probably more than two processes but the two process model says there are two basic things uh, one is c the other is s the c process is basically circadian right mm -hmm. so we know circadian clock is controlled in the mammalian brain in the suprachiasmatic nucleus right so that nucleus itself is standalone you can take it out in the dish and it still oscillates at 24 hour cycles right um, so, so, you know, the circadian system, no doubt has to somehow influence the sleep circuit, right? But the other process they call the S process is sleep homeostasis. Um, so the, um, uh, some people also call it sleep pressure, right? So the idea is that if you have been awake for a long time, then you build up sleep pressure and then you, you feel sleepier, right? In fact, that that has become sort of the central focus of my lab right now. And the reason why we decided to focus on the S process is because for the two processes, circadian is actually kind of pretty well known, right? I mean, you know, it's the SEN and, you know, the molecular clock and, and the rest is kind of a circuit mapping. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, but you know, it's a solvable problem. Um, but the homeostatic process is, less well known, right? Because it's a long process and, and, you know, what makes you sleepy after, you know, right? A certain amount of time. Um, and it's also linked to this question of what's the function of sleep. So if you think about it, feeding is homeostatic, right? So the function of feeding is to replenish energy. And, and so if you fed a long time ago, you haven't been feeding for a long time, then you accumulate feeding pressure, and that also signals the energy needs, right? And so I think the sleep, hopefully sleep homeostasis is fundamentally linked to the function of sleep. And this is why we're kind of really hoping to figure that out and, and hopefully to answer this other question of why we have to sleep. Yeah, that's very cool. Looking forward to that talk <laughs> in the future, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Yang, again, uh, for this great presentation and also a very active question and answer. I think we are kind of uh, lagging the, uh, the the time of the talk. So uh, let's close this session and also move to the individual meetings, uh, maybe after a five minutes break, uh, like seven minutes from now. Thanks everyone for coming and asking these great questions and uh, see you next two weeks.